I'm not sure if I should start. I'm supposed somebody's supposed to be here or not, but give it another minute and then I'll get started. So how many people here are familiar with Python? IPython. IPython notebook. No one. Oh, good. Okay. So for the Python people, uh, IPython is kind of like a Python command line on steroids. Uh, much more powerful commands, command completion, all kinds of uh, stuff. Uh, extensions, the ability to run a bash script and put things in there and all kinds of things. Uh, an IPython notebook uh, takes that and basically runs that in the browser but adds a lot of browser specific things to it like you can you can show images and uh, do a lot of computation. So you can think of it as Mathematica for Python, if you will, if you're familiar with the math Mathematica concept of computable notebooks. Uh, you have code and uh, the document mixed together, and you can go to the code part of the document and hit shift enter, and it executes it and puts the result in there. So IPython notebook is like that. So it gives you a great uh, environment to uh, try out stuff, and in this case, uh, I, I created actually a, a lot of learning materials for data science. Uh, I was funded, so let me get started. Uh, that's me, and that's one first thing is a little bit of uh, whatever electronics I did a long time ago. Um, and uh, I'm also started playing with some of these things. So here's a black beagle bone just to get my creds up. Uh, and I'm uh, getting interested back again in data that is coming online because of all the Internet of Things. Uh, so there's a vast amount of data. People are uh, in most of these uh, talks talking about uh, the electronics, about the sensors, and how to interpret things. But when you have a vast amount of similar pieces of information coming in, you've got to do some pattern recognition. You've got to do some analysis. You've got to do some trend uh, analysis. And so uh, Learn Data Science is applicable there, uh, the, the, the project and the content, because uh, it's meant for Python developers to quickly pick up data science. So that's about the about data science in general, that's what I saw over the last three or four years. Uh, there are three things people need to become really active in data sciences. You, sh you should be able to get in and use a script language, uh, Python if you're a developer, or if you're coming from the statistics background, either of them will get you started. Uh, you need a non-trivial amount of data experience. Uh, typically, that's a, if you're a web developer or a developer, you've used MySQL, you know what a CSV file is, that's enough to get started. But often, if you're coming from the statistics background, you probably, all you know is a select star from table and put it into a data frame, and then you don't deal with the data side anymore. If you want to do data science, you've got to be able to do, uh, interact with many different kinds of data sources. And uh, a lot of us who came from a technical background and then started developing let our math skills kind of generally uh, exponentially decay. So same thing happened to me, so I wanted to get back in, and over the last three or four years, I. Well, bought a stack of textbooks and got back in there with the goal of saying that if I can get back in, then I can create learning materials to teach other people to get back in. And I was funded by Pivotal. Uh, they were at that time EMC Greenplum. And their interest is that they have a data science uh, business. Uh, it's in their interest to make data science more, uh, more, more developers data science aware. So they funded me from, uh, for a year to write this material and uh, so there's uh, one basic set of four algorithms there. Uh, it's not the final thing. I want to be able to do another stint on doing that and add some more. Uh, essentially, I based what algorithms to pick out of a paper that said top 10, uh, top 10 algorithms in data mining. And the people asked all the practitioners in data mining what their favorite algorithms were, and then they, they did all that, and then they gave a list of 10 of them. So I started, and I also asked the people in the data science team at Greenplum, what do your customers use mostly? And so they told me a few things, and plus I uh, added a couple of my own. And so the learnds.com, which, which really takes you to a GitHub repository, uh, it's got all the notebooks, it has all the data uh, that you need, and uh, essentially it's got four algorithms, uh, linear regression, logistic regression, k-means clustering, and random forests. And I'm going to motivate some of that uh, in this talk. And uh, 
essentially, if you so there's depends on what level you're coming from. Uh, if you're if you're comfortable learning math, uh, even if you've forgotten all of it, uh, the first lesson in 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 uh, learnds.com uh, is uh, linear regression, and that's a long sounding thing. But most of you, if you've been through high school chemistry lab. You, you plot a bunch of points and you jiggle a ruler until you can get the best fit line. That's linear regression done automatically without a human being doing that. So you give it a bunch of points and it figures out what the optimum uh, slope is and what the optimum y-intercept is. And that's your linear model for your points. Now, your points may not fit a linear model. So there's tricks to change the space so that you twist the space around so that it makes it into a linear model. And then, but first you've got to learn the basics of linear regression. And then uh, the next step is a logistic regression, which is essentially thresholds. You have, you have data that looks like it's two level data and you want to find uh, the next data point that comes along. Is it at the high level or is it a low level? And logistic regression helps you do that, assuming you've got a nice uh, sort of uh, logistic curve or something similar. And often data science or, or, or things like this are about trying out different things. There's an exploratory phase when you're given a bunch of data to find out what fits best. And then after you've done your exploration, you start a mod you create a model. And after you create a model, that becomes your representation for this particular uh, source of data. And then after that, whenever data comes in, you're going to look and see and use this model to predict or to classify. Essentially, most of data science uh, practice comes down to two or three things. One is you're trying to take existing data and you're trying to predict the future. Uh, we had this sales data from the past six months. Are people going to buy more or less uh, based on a model that you create? Um, how do I predict uh, whether uh, people are going to buy, whether, whether people are going to uh, move around, how, what are the population trends, that's a whole other way of uh, looking at things. Uh, or um, I have users on my website, uh, they seem to follow certain patterns, some people use the app this way, some people use the app that way. How do I cluster them, how do I serve them, how do I make sure that the features are enough, that uh, most active users, etc. So that's, that's clustering and classification. So essentially, those, those are the two large areas, and I'm, I'm simplifying considerably for a one-hour talk, but uh, in a large, largely uh, you're trying to take existing data and predict the future, or take existing data and classify it into patterns so that the next piece of data that comes in, say it looks like this, or this, or this. And so that's largely what you're trying to do. So we're going to take one specific uh, example that I have there, and it's in one of my later uh, uh, lessons. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into it after introducing you to the lesson set. Uh, but uh, please, if you're going to take this and, and you're actually going to use it, start from the beginning and work through it because there are a number of methodology things that I keep adding. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, both IPython notebook and math and you just want to get into it, then go straight for it. But it's not advisable to jump straight into the third lesson, which is this what it is. And if you want to do this, uh, typically, one weekend for each set of each algorithm and four weekends. It's built for that. It's like if you take an immersion, uh, if, if you're familiar with Python, IPython, and, and Notebook, then it'll be easier for you. Otherwise, you'll have to spend a day or two just getting familiar with the metaphor. But the goal is, uh, you know, as people who are working in the field, we don't have time to go take a lesson. Or we don't have time to take a class. So we should have things that allow us to get exploring quickly. And once, you're, once you get exploring and once you do things useful, uh, then you get interested enough and motivated enough. But this is to get you jump started. That's why we're here. So we're going to take this Android phone data set. And essentially what it is is it's, uh, it's a bunch of accelerometer and gyroscope readings from an Android phone that was taken by an Italian uh, university. Uh, they attach these phones to people, and then they uh, figured out or asked them at different times of the day what they were doing. I think they actually followed them around. I don't know. But uh, they had six different uh, activities, uh, standing, sitting, lying down, walking, walking up, and walking down. And they, they took this for about 25, 30 people. And what we're going to do is to learn if, if we take, say, 20 of them and we build a model. How good is it to try and predict the other 10, which we have held out? And this methodology uh, where you 
hold out a certain part of your data set when you're modeling. It's an important thing because you don't want to create a model that only fits your complete data, and then the next thing that comes along causes it to break. Sometimes your model can be overfitted to your data. So the way you test that is you leave some data out, you only create a model for a part of your data, and then the data that you left out, you try to predict. If, if your model is good, and if your, mo uh, if your model is good enough, I've done that, so it's okay. <laughs> so uh, if your model is good enough, then it'll be close uh, even on the data that you didn't use uh, to build your model. And so we're gonna do that uh, quickly. Uh, so why, is, why machine learning some quick motivation? Uh, things are interesting to me because they generate a lot of data. And you go from data to information. You know, you might just be looking for a threshold crossing detec detection. But to me, if there's hundreds of these and they're all crossing the threshold at a certain point, maybe there's something else going on besides the single thing crossing a threshold. So you want to uh, do that uh, if you want to, you know, to do uh, uh, a lot of analysis of oceanographic data or atmospheric data or whatever, uh, you can do that. Uh, so you want to understand the data better. Uh, we are, the Internet of Things, there's a lot of focus on the things. And I just want to uh, add something which says that data that comes from these things is just as interesting and, and useful to spend time learning about. Uh, so we have data types, uh, we have metadata, and just I'm going to quickly step through a couple of things that I picked up from this book, Make Sensors, uh, just was my way to get deeply into it quickly. I don't work for O'Reilly, I'm not an author of this book or anything, just uh, saying it was a good book. So different types of uh, sensors, and what are the kinds of data that you get out of them. Uh, again, something in there. Uh, so you, can, you might get binary values, you might get percentages, fractions, uh, time intervals, strings of bytes, uh, some angular measure, things like that. All of these kind of data types. And here are the types of sensors that you might want. One idea I had was maybe you want a collection of sensors in a box, different parts of your house, outside, constantly reading ambient stuff. And then uh, you might see patterns that change over summer and winter, and you might pattern uh, day, night, uh, high temperature, low temperature, suddenly somebody enters your house or comes nearby. You might be able to see patterns if you've got a ton of data you're collecting. So there's metadata along with it. Uh, it's important to know what time it is, where it is, uh, where it came from, uh, if there's a user associated with like a phone, who that person was. So, so along with the data, there's this other thing that you want to calculate. And uh, here's an example of a data vector that you might have, a timestamp, a geolocation, uh, a sensor ID, a user ID, and XYZ acceleration uh, values. Uh, so you want to get a large number of these, and you want to um, draw some conclusions from that. So how do you use it? As I said earlier, it's a prediction typically, or classification of behavior. A yes, no decisions is just another kind of classification. It's just two things. And uh, you can combine a lot of these. Now, I can wait here for a minute. This is a very interesting uh, uh, URL if you want to take it down. Uh, this is a guy who uh, took a, a uh, machine, one of the first machine learning classes that was offered on Coursera. And he used uh, neural networks to go and guide a, a RC-controlled car over a stripe on the, uh, uh, on the carpet. And uh, he attached an Android phone, and it was taking snapshots uh, off the area around a uh, few milliseconds, and it was sending it to a laptop, which was running a neural network, and it was sending controlled information back. It was a fascinating thing, and it's the, the video is still on there. So uh, you can use machine learning uh, along with uh, radio control devices, uh, sensors to do fun things, fascinating things, or, you know, that will probably grow into something much more useful later. So uh, playing around with that, if you know a little bit of machine learning, you can do a lot. So what do I need? Uh, some machine learning tools and some training. Um, typically, these are the algorithms that we're going to talk about a little bit. And uh, I'm going to give you an uh, example. With, uh, I'll talk about the data source, and I'll actually walk through the, the notebooks first uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the set of lessons and then actually diving deep into the random forest example. So I, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, the key thing here was that the, the amount of data there 
uh, was a massive amount of very dirty data. There was like a 530 or so dimensions to the data. A lot of it were redundant. Some of it was Fourier transforms of other things. Uh, some of it was uh, what time domain, frequency domain. Um, and then some of it was just double measurements. It was just very badly done data set. And, and the, the column names had things like function name parentheses in them. So it's a classic example of real world data you'll pick up. And a lot of uh, work you will do is to clean up that data to make it useful to a machine learning algorithm. So uh, the lessons that I have actually talk about data cleanup as an important part of uh, data science. And there's a joke there uh, in, in data science that you'll hear uh, saying that you spend 80% of your time cleaning up the data and 20% of the time complaining about the fact that you had to clean up the data. So essentially, data cleanup is a lot. The rest of it is getting more and more automated. Uh, and, and increasingly, uh, that there's a professor at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, Joe Hellerstein, who's called this the industrial age of data because uh, previously human beings used to produce data and human beings used to consume and process data. Uh, then uh, human beings started producing data and machines started processing it. But now with the Internet of Things, machines are producing data and other machines will be processing that data. And this is the beginning of the industrial age of data where uh, data pipelines are going from machine to machine to machine and finally we're producing either, a, uh, either an outcome in terms of a, a, a motor action or some result on a dashboard or something. But there are large pipelines where machines produce and consume data intermediate steps where human beings uh, don't, uh, uh, are not involved. And so uh, we will talk about this uh, a little later, random forests. I'm going to get that into detail. It's, 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 it's one of the algorithms that are available. If you spend any time on Kaggle, which is a place where data scientists compete with each other to try and solve problems, some of them have uh, money attached to them, some of them. Uh, but they, they, it's a great place to actually hone your skills because uh, there's, it's a great community. It has a bunch of tools that people provide. Uh, and it's, it's very Python friendly. Most of the tools available are Python. And uh, random forests is very, are very popular on Kaggle. That's why I mentioned Kaggle in this, in this case. And essentially, uh, when you're uh, analyzing massive amounts of dirty data, one of the big things that you have to do that I, that I did not add here, but I should, is uh, you have a large number of variables. And one of the things you want to find out out of these hundreds of variables are which are the top 20 or 30 important variables. So uh, variable selection or dimensionality reduction, uh, those things are extremely important in these, in these kind of data sets. And random forests help you to do that very well. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll look at that very quickly. So how do you get started? Uh, in case you're not doing any of these things, then please do. Uh, and uh, we are, there are these other resources, and I hope uh, the, the, the presentation here will be put up somewhere so you can go and follow all of these things. Uh, the hackerspace is Noise Bridge in the city and Hacker Dojo. They run machine learning. There are a lot of people there that hang out and, and teach either, each other machine learning. So if you want to go serious about picking these up, those are good places. They're also Internet of Things uh, places. So uh, that's a good place to go and hang out. And I, right there, I'm going to switch to uh, this. So first of all, IPython Notebook, if you haven't seen it, ipython.org slash notebook. That's an example of something. Let me see. Yeah. That's an example of something you could do. Uh, so you can see you can do math in the browser. Uh, you can, uh, there's, there's a package called SciPy, which is a scientific Python uh, package. And uh, it, it, you can, as you can see with a couple of lines, you can import a WAV file, plot it, and do all kinds of interesting things with it. So. I would strongly recommend going and looking at ipython.org and ipython notebook uh, in, in more detail. If you go to uh, learnds.com and download things, there's some instructions that tell you download it, uh, CD to the directory, and then uh, go to the notebooks directory, start up ipython. So that's what I've done here. You this is my Git repo on my machine for the learn data science stuff that's up on GitHub. You cd to the notebooks directory where all the notebooks are. You start up the notebooks. And this pylab equals inline is a command that 
make sure that when you type something, the results are in line. Otherwise, they come up in a separate window, which gets irritating, and it's, it's uh, difficult to package the notebook and its results. But if you do that, and all, this, all these instructions, by the way, are in the, it, in the repository itself. So if you download it, you will see all these things. I'm just stepping it through so you don't, so you don't feel like I'm just jumping straight into things you don't understand. Uh, and then when you start it up, you'll see a bunch of notebooks have been started up. And then you go to, it will actually start up your browser and take you to the home page. So IPython Notebook does that. So if you're here, uh, this, is, this is the place where all the notebooks reside. Uh, I would recommend you go to the Before You Begin Notebook, which tells you a little bit about how to actually use the notebooks if you haven't ever used IPython Notebook before. And uh, you can see there's A, B, C, and D sets. The W is all worksheets, so it's the same thing, but with all the math and stuff pulled out so you can play with it and not mess up your notebook. So you'll see the W versions of all of those. And at the bottom here, you'll see a quick tour of IPython notebook, which also is taken from that website. Uh, it tells you the different things you can do. You can play around with it. Um, you can put images. Uh, you can actually plug in a YouTube video, uh, I guess my Stuff is not working here. Uh, there's video here. Uh, he, what you might see here is actually an embedded Wikipedia iframe. So you can plug in things. You can, you can compose this notebook out of a bunch of different things. So that's uh, as much as I'm going to talk about notebooks. The next part, of course, uh, I'm going to step into the linear regression part to give you a soft introduction to what these notebooks are all about. And as I mentioned, uh, if you remember your physics or chemistry lab experiments, you had a bunch of points. You tried to take a line through it, and you wanted to calculate what the slope is and what the intercept is. And what you were doing there is really what the simplest form of linear regression. And then later on, it gets more and more complicated. It gets multidimensional. It's, there's a linear space, which is not Cartesian. And there's all kinds of other ways. But there is a uh, linear regression comes down to the same uh, optimization that you do underneath to find the slope and the intercept and the models. So uh, what you did by hand, uh, some software will do for you. And essentially, you have, you know, one person may have drawn it here, and the other person may have drawn it here. So how do you know what is the best? How does the software know what is the best? So there is a, there is a particular uh, measure, uh, a, an error, or a norm that the software calculates for each candidate line. And it does this over all possible lines in that space, and then finds the one where the total error is the least, and that's your best line. And so this principle of trying to find a model by calculating an overall error and trying to minimize that error, uh, that's a principle that's used in all of these uh, places where you're trying to create a predictive model in the linear space or in other spaces as well. So one example that uh, uh, I do here is uh, taking uh, loan data. So this is just something you'd work on. It's not nothing to do with Internet of Things. We'll be getting there. Shortly, I should keep track of time. We have here. Uh, okay. So, what we have here is uh, data from a, a website called the Lending uh, Lending Club, and it's a place you can go there. You can lend people money, or you can make you can borrow money, and it's kind of like a marketplace for loans. Uh, not really, uh, not a not a. In the, in the securitization sense, but it's a place where it's a peer lending site. You can say, I'm looking for a loan for 20K, and I'm hoping to get it at a 10% interest, and here's my FICO score, et cetera. And somebody who feels that you're a good risk might give you the loan. And then you promise to make some payments and that kind of thing. And they make their data available anonymized. So it's a good place to see if you can create a predictive model for uh, if you have a certain FICO score, and if, you have, if you're looking for a certain interest rate, what's the possibility of getting one of those? And if you just plot this, and there's a lot of other variables, by the way. It, it turns out after you go through all of this that those are the more significant ones. There are others like uh, uh, what geography or what zip code you're in and how old you are and all kinds of things, which turn out to be less relevant than these two major ones. Right. So, uh, so first you try to see if you can predict uh, what interest rate you'll get based on your FICO score. And turns out that if you pick a FICO score, you still got a big range. It's not telling you much. So maybe there's something else besides your FICO score. And so maybe that simple model of one variable didn't work, and maybe it's two things. 
And so you're looking at a data set with two. So that's how you look at, you, you visualize, you try to model, you visualize, you try to model, you try to come out with a better thing. So that's how you get up. So, so these, these samples could be something that's coming from sensors. It could be something else. And you're trying to create, try to find what's creating the variation in the data and how can I create a model from this. So, so that would be uh, the first part. And then I go into it in a little bit more detail. I explore the data. And we browse the data, and you, you, there's a bunch of things, loan length, loan purpose, debt to income ratio, your state, your home ownership. All of these things turn out to be less useful than a couple of things. And what we find from there is that there's, there are some, we do some plotting, we do some, so I'm gonna step through this quickly because I wanna to get to the, the Android data set. But this is the kind of stuff that you would do to explore a new data set. In this case, it's a simpler data set with just a couple of variables. And uh, in the end, we're going to say uh, FICO and loan amount are independent variables. So it's not just your score, but how much money you're asking for. That will also determine your interest rate, uh, what bigger loss the person will uh, have if you, if you default, and how good a, a risk are. So those are the things that after all this exploration, we turn out those are the more important ones. And then we build a model. And then we try to see if that's a good predictive model. So uh, that's an example of the kind of things we do, but I'm gonna go straight now to uh, the random forest example. And if you actually go uh, here, it'll, it'll talk you through why we use random forests. So uh, mostly in, in, in Internet of Things areas, we have a large number of uh, data variables. And, and the Android data set that I talked about, they had 500 variables, uh, a lot of messy data. So this, it doesn't, make any sense to expect the human being to walk through this and to do any kind of uh, hand, the kind you did in your physics or chemistry lab uh, stuff is not possible humanly for something that has 500 variables. So you need some uh, sort of uh, heavy machinery to do that, and Random Forest provides that. So, but before that, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about decision trees. And uh, with decision trees, this is an example of something up on Wiki Wikipedia, is like who survived uh, on the Titanic. And uh, it's basically if you knew a bunch of things, if you were male, you had less of a chance of surviving because women and children first. And uh, then if you were in the better uh, class of uh, 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 reservation, then you survived more than the others. Uh, and so you can quickly partition this data set and give you a good idea of who survived simply based on a few few categories. And uh, it's, it's talked about in some detail on Wikipedia, but th th that's a decision tree on a small data set, on a few hundred data points and uh, a few variables. But uh, again, for this Android data set that we're talking about, accelerometer and gyroscope data, a decision tree is not very good because for large data sets and large variables, it's, it doesn't have great predictive power. It may be 55% you know, or 60% accurate or something, and you want a lot better than that. And so, you know, people who, who do this for a living uh, have come up with uh, ensemble methods, which is you take a bunch of different uh, approaches. In this case, you take a bunch of different decision trees together, and you randomly take subsets of your data and, and give, it, give it to a decision tree, and then ask it to create a model. And then you combine these models together uh, all through uh, some programs and packages that are available both in R and Python. So uh, in some sense, the math you need to know is not really math you need to do but math you need to be not scared of to run programs with. So you need to be, understand a little bit of percentages, errors, things like that, and you can grow with it slowly, grow into it. And it's mostly now productized in terms of a program that does that for you. So again, the goal of this lesson is to make it simpler to reduce the barrier for programmers to pick up uh, machine learning. And so uh, if you want to, look into the math behind it, then these are the keywords you want to go and do some research on. But I'm going to jump straight into uh, how do you actually use this. So uh, we do some data exploration, and that will tell you the big mess that you have. So this is, this is the messy data we had. We had duplicate column names sometimes. We had parentheses in column names. Sometimes we had an ex extra parentheses in a column name. So if you try to do some things with regular expressions and clean it up, you had, a, you had a hyphen in a column name, which, which is really bad in Python, uh, inclusion of multiple commas in column names, and many column names have you know, badly written English even. 
So when you actually want to use this, uh, this is a data set that comes with the Git repo that you'll download. It has the Samsung data in it in a large CSV file. You'll import it, uh, and then uh, we change the activity to be a categorical variable, which is a variable that says, uh, this is not a number, it's one out of four or five categories. And you want to predict that. Uh, you want to keep the subject, meaning the person, as an integer. That's the, that's the one out of 30 people or so we had. And other than that, we want to figure out how to do this. So I did this in two ways, actually. The first time, I actually opened up the uh, Android uh, uh, manual for accelerometer and gyroscopes and understood how it works and then figured out if you're sitting, standing, what do we think from pure physics, what would be the important variables? And then I went and hand-picked about 30 variables out of all of those. And I renamed them by hand, and then I created a model. And then later on, I just fed the whole mess to a random forest. I, basically, I just took 500 variables and renamed them X1 through X500. Now, the difference between the two is, and this is, a, this is something you'll find in data science all the time, uh, do I need to know anything about my data set? Do I need to have domain knowledge? And does domain knowledge help in analyzing data? As opposed to, can I just bring a high-powered algorithm and will it tell me everything? Ideally, a good balance of both is useful, but it's surprising how much is, can be done with random forests just to reduce the number of variables, and then you can use your domain knowledge. It's very hard to use domain knowledge when you have 500 variables. It's very hard. The brain doesn't do good stuff with that many variables at one time. But you bring it down a little more, and then our pattern processing and the machines can be uh, uh, balanced together. So, uh, so this is a question. I first did it purely with domain knowledge, and then I did it purely in the black box approach. It's called the black box approach. You'll, you'll get a model, but you won't know what the variables mean. And uh, you won't understand what happens if one of those variables changes. You really won't have a deep understanding of the model. So black box approaches are great, if you go to Kaggle and you've got to come up with a model within 24 hours and you've got to win the competition. But if you've got to actually operationalize that model and if you've got to put it into practice and you've got to come back and feed it data and you're responsible for the output of that model, uh, having a, a better understanding of what the underlying data is and the domain is critical. Otherwise, you'll fail uh, eventually. Uh, no machine can predict everything for the future and the human being needs to balance that. So uh, what I did here was I said, you know, in static activities, uh, motion information is not going to be that useful. In the dynamic activities, motion will be significant. And this is just me heuristically figuring out all this stuff. And then an example of things I did was I, I actually uh, plotted some of them with some colors. And uh, these are the different colors for the different classes of activities. And this is an, one of the variables, which is the body acceleration magnitude, the magnitude of acceleration of the body. Uh, and it's uh, how much or uh, amplitude of how, how many of these uh, data sets had that. And so you can see that, uh, you know, the, the, the bluer variables, which are walking, walking down, and walking up, were clustered together, and the more static ones, uh, li lying down, sitting, and standing, were over here, where they didn't have, it's almost, uh, the acceleration is almost nothing, uh, and uh, here it's a large spread. Uh, relative spread of the acceleration. And so this is the kind of thing I did by just manually exploring stuff. It was tedious, it was interesting, very interesting, but very tedious. Took days to figure it out. And then I got down to a, a set of, and then I had to change these things by hand and cut out all the crap in the name and then bring it down to something. And so I reduced it down to this set. And then uh, I'll take you to the next step. And then we started doing the modeling, right? So a little bit in the earlier is how you design your experiment, the bit I talked to you about holding some data set out. So there's a, there's a bit of that. Uh, how do we design your experiment? How do you have a validation set? Uh, so what we did here was we took, uh, let me see how many. Uh, last four subjects of the 17 remaining subjects use the first 12. So, so there's, there's a methodology for trying different stuff out and making sure you hold out something so that you're not over, uh, overfitting your model. And so there's a training part. You, there's a data set. Uh, I, I split the data set into three parts, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. And the training set is the set that you take to create your model. 
uh, a validation set is a, a set that you use from in there to see how good your model is. And then you commit to that model, and then you apply the test. And once you apply the test, you cannot go back and remodel. You, uh, that just tells you how good your model is, or you maybe you want to try something else. Or maybe you want to re-randomize everything and start over. Uh, typically, if it's really, really, really off, uh, then you may be using the wrong algorithm to try this. So, so now from this point on, it's all about what's available to you in a Python to do random forests. Okay, so I would suggest we uh, take a look at some of the Python data analysis, uh, or rather the Python machine learning stuff. There's something called sklearn, and uh, sklearn.ensemble. So all of these things, by the way, they're all in the code here. As I said, this is a jump start. Hopefully this will get you interested enough to go and play. Uh, there's a Google uh, email list. And if you sign up, then you can go ask questions. And then uh, I'll, I'm on the list. And if you're using it and you're finding some difficulties, I'll be happy to help you. But uh, what we did here was we did a training of this. And uh, what we're seeing here is that there's, there's a very crude estimate of accuracy called the out-of-band out of score. It's a, there's a statistics explanation behind that. Uh, but it tells you that if you try it, you might get anything in the 90s. The out-of-band score tells 97. We haven't modeled anything yet, but it's telling you that you've got a good chance of getting a good model out of this. And then uh, what I do here is to say, uh, give me the top 10 variables. So this is the important part. Even if you don't use random variables for your model, if you use random variables to just do dimensionality reduction and pick up the top 10 variables, that's what it came out with. It said that in terms of how much uh, variance in the data, meaning how many different values uh, this, va this particular dimension is capturing, uh, if you look at these numbers, it'll tell you the, the x angle to gravity is a big one. Uh, the jerk, uh, the twist, gyro jerk gravity is the amount you're twisting, uh, is also another big one. And then there are a couple of others in here. Uh, and so I'm going to, again, step through this quickly. Most of these are one-liners, and there's a lot of explanation in the words. But I want to come to this thing called the confusion matrix. This is an important way to tell whether your predictions are ambiguous or unambiguous. That's why it's called the confusion matrix. And you see the numbers here. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are the different categories, the six activities. And one of them is what you're predicting, and the other one is what it actually is. So what it's telling you is that sitting, I think, which was 0, you get a pretty unambiguous prediction for when somebody's sitting. You don't confuse that with any of the other activities. And if you think about that, there's probably some reasons uh, for that. But there are a couple of others where you're either uh, standing or walking. Uh, then there is some confusion between those two. Uh, and whether you're going, uh, walking up or walking down, maybe there's some other confusion between those two. So how, how accurate those are in terms of how many times you hit the right bucket and not. If you had these large and you had a lot of them spread out away from the diagonal, then you don't have that much confidence in the fact that that is that prediction. Uh, if, if you only have colors on the diagonal, then you have more uh, uh, confidence in the fact that your classification is good. And then there are some numerical estimates. Uh, there's uh, accuracy and precision, and these have the same meaning as they have in, you know, uh, when people are looking up or doing search and other things. Uh, so it's, you're doing about 90%, which is pretty good for something that was done you know, by hand, mostly, and to run uh, some of these things. Uh, and uh, so it's about 90%, and the out-of-band uh, error estimate is about 2%. So again, going rapidly through a number of these things, if you're interested, you should work through the previous lessons. And then I'm going to go and show you what happened when I did it uh, in automated fashion. So that would be the last thing I do here. Uh, this random forests data cleanup, I think, is what it was. So here, uh, instead of doing things by hand, I just went and uh, uh, call it x1 through xn, and I just threw it at the uh, algorithm. And what I got was, here are your variables. I don't know what they are, right? But it's telling me that these are your top 10 important variables. And this is the difference. In the previous one, I could interpret the meaning of those variables because it said jerk, gravity, or magnitude, or whatever. And here it's just one of those dimensions. OK. 
Uh, and then when I do the similar thing, I get roughly similar looking. And when I do a number, I get I got 0.89 by hand and 0.91 by this. And uh, so as a first pass, you could do this. You could look at the, those variables. I mean, it, you don't see it here, but there was a mapping. So you could work backwards and say, OK, that was actually an acceleration. That was actually some gravity, something or the other. But in the long term, uh, if you have a very large data set that's very messy, uh, the random forest approach to reducing the number of variables is extremely useful. So especially if you're taking data from phones that has all of these things, uh, please take a look at this. Uh, please use it. Uh, and uh, please give me feedback. I'll be writing more of this stuff. And uh, for the rest of the time that I have, uh, questions or, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about yeah. your, um, the data. Yeah. Yes. Uh, was it temporal data you're getting, or a, a statistic on the on like the sensor data? Uh, you well, the readings that <clears throat> the readings that I had had uh, they appeared to be sensor data that had also been transformed in some way, okay. because it had some t some things prefixed by t, okay. and others prefixed by f. So maybe there was a Fourier transformation applied to something. So there were some frequency readings and T readings. I don't know if the Android uh, gyroscope gives you frequency readings, so maybe it was raw data. But this was the result of a, uh, an experiment done uh, in an Italian university. And I can give you the, it's called the HAR data set, Human Activity Recognition. And all the information, by the way, is in, if you download this, uh, there's, there's a pointer to the original uh, research. And if, if you're familiar with the data science uh, area, there's, there's a repository uh, from the University of Irvine, UCI data set repository. So this data set is there with details of the experiment. And so you can see actually what the uh, raw data was. Um, and uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a document along with the data that explains. It's kind of like a, a, a sort of metadata exploring, a data catalog kind of uh, document. So that will explain to you what each of the columns is. Uh, but uh, it was a lot of raw data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Other? Okay, thank you.